baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the Sunday after Easter, we always tell the story of doubting Thomas in John's Gospel. Thomas could be the postmodernism poster child. And perhaps that's why many of us connect so easily with his skepticism. It's a very 21st century story. After all, like Thomas, we have been conditioned to expect and demand empirical proof, concrete evidence that appearance equates with reality. We're hesitant to just take someone's word for it or to accept gossip and hearsay as fact. On Easter morning, we recounted how Mary Magdalene, the first witness to the resurrection, ran to Peter and John to inform them of the wondrous news that Jesus had appeared to her. And yet they thought her report was an idle tale. And now today, Thomas declares, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. It seems that doubt is hardwired into the human psyche and I think it's gotten a really bad rap. As faithful Christians, we need doubt. In 2016, if we were to meet the risen Lord, we'd likely be pretty doubtful and say something like, okay, go to Northwestern and get a CT scan of those wounds and show me the lab results and then maybe I'll believe. <laughs> or hey Jesus, let's take a selfie so I can post it on Instagram and then I'll believe it's really you. But in the age of Photoshop, when the fake can be made to seem true, we don't even take evidence at face value. Many Christians I know grew up being discouraged from asking too many questions about the faith, debating key doctrines of the church or regarding with skepticism the content found in Holy Scripture. Doubt was often framed as the opposite of faith. To doubt what the church taught or what Scripture said was a mark of weak faith. There are many people who probably remember that old church adage that the job of the laity was to pay, pray, and obey. But fortunately, times are different. I believe that the church is solid enough to withstand scrutiny, and the people of God smart enough and insightful enough to debate the quest tough questions of faith. Doubt is really a sign of curiosity. It's a sign that we're taking the faith seriously and are invested in making sense of it, whether on an intellectual, emotional, or experiential level. Doubt recognizes that the problem we're wrestling with is important, worth the sleepless nights and intellectual acrobatics that we put ourselves through to come to a deeper understanding of God. If the topic were trivial, we wouldn't expend so much energy to consider whether it was true or not. We'd respond with a lukewarm, meh, and move on to something more worthy of our attention. The admission of doubt and an attempt to dispel it through proof states that the subject in question merits intensive reflection. Thomas's refusal to believe it's really Jesus in the absence of proof is a recognition that the resurrection is a high-stakes proposition. Better be sure about this one, Thomas's brain urges him. It's a doozy, and there will be serious consequences if we get it wrong. In fact, even when we get it right, the repercussions are severe. For the first four centuries or so of Christianity, Jesus' followers were persecuted and martyred for asserting that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. And they still are in many places around the world. In Doubting Thomas' story, Jesus demonstrates patience and respect in the face of Thomas's skepticism. Instead of just telling him to have more faith and quit asking stupid questions, Jesus invites him to touch his wounds so that his disciple may know that he is who he says he is. Doubt can be understood as a reaching out to learn more. This doesn't make sense to me. Can you help me to understand? Is there a piece of this that I'm missing? Have I failed to comprehend some key point? Doubt is at the heart of good theological inquiry, an attempt to make the mystery of God more comprehensible. 
I'm not sure I've got this quite right. There are things that don't make sense to me. Let's see if I can make the pieces fit together better. The Anglican tradition bases the quest for God's truth on the three pillars of scripture, tradition, and reason. We work with all of them to respond to our doubt, our curious impulse to know God better. After Thomas touches his wounds, Jesus asks him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Some may regard this as criticism of Thomas's doubt. But maybe that's not what's going on. Perhaps Jesus is articulating the fact that his disciples, including us, will not always be able to rely on concrete evidence. We won't always have the luxury of being able to stick our fingers in the mark of the nails to know that it's him and that he is present among us. Jesus remarks repeatedly that he will not always be with the twelve, that they will have to learn to get along in his absence. They'll have to figure out things for themselves sometimes. Earlier in the Gospel of John, Jesus tells the disciples, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Jesus then perplexes them by stating cryptically, a little while and you will no longer see me. And then a little while and you will see me. The Jesus they know and love will be gone and yet he will still be present among them through the power of the advocate, the Holy Spirit, that he will send to work among them. Like Mary Magdalene, who mistakes the risen Lord for the gardener until he calls her name. And like the disciples in the Gospel of Luke, who don't recognize Jesus until he breaks bread with them, Thomas isn't sure it's Jesus until he has some clear sign. Doubt is a sign of our struggle to be faithful disciples when we're not sure what to believe. When we can't put our fingers in Jesus' wounds to be sure it's him. Sometimes we think he's just the gardener. The consequence of recognizing the resurrected Jesus is that we are commanded to go out into the world to preach the resurrection. Peace be with you, he says to his disciples. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And then he breathed on them and conferred the Holy Spirit to lead them into all truth as he had promised. In baptism and confirmation, we emphasize the bestowal of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which include wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord, which help us to recognize Jesus in each other, in the bread and wine at communion, in the exquisite elegance of the cosmos. The doubt we express in religion is really not so different from the curiosity and skepticism we exhibit when we test a scientific hypothesis, or marvel at the kindness or the cruelty in human nature, or witness new life when we thought there was only death. In these moments, we are invited to wonder, to ask questions, to debate, to hesitate, to do some heavy lifting. We may want proof even when there is none to be had. But Jesus calls us to continue to seek the truth, to be curious about what we encounter. And if we're lucky, to find at times evidence, and more importantly, an experience that Jesus is the son of the living God, the Messiah. Doubt is our friend and companion on this journey. Amen. <laughs>